Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&As. It's Thursday morning, so hopefully everybody has enough time to get their questions in, but let's jump in and see what we got. First up, over on Floatplane, Amon said they've been testing more with AVR and HDMI CEC, and came to the conclusion that their Harman Kardon AVR just doesn't support it correctly. They did find a compromise by using a Logitech Harmony Companion Remote, and then connect the TV to the AVR with optical audio. That works great, and the only compromise is that the Apple TV remote isn't being used. So that's fine, just remember that you're going to get compressed audio through optical and no Dolby Atmos or anything like that. But if that doesn't affect the content that you're watching, then it definitely doesn't matter at all. But yeah, that's a tough one. And it it's a hard thing because the TV, the AVR, and then whatever your streaming box, Blu-ray player, whatever else, they all have to support it properly for it all to work right. And I've never seen any two setups work exactly the same. So as long as you have a solution that works for you, then that's totally cool. I've gotten very lucky that ever since swapping around setups at my house, everything seems to be working great. Uh, knock on wood, there's always something that goes wrong with my setups though, because my house is a test bed. It's not, it's, it's kind of funny to explain that to people. Like, don't think of my house as like, oh, what a cool setup. Think of it as like, this is my lab that I test all of the stuff that I work on. So it's, you know, it, it, things break more often at my place than they do at most other people's because I'm constantly changing it. So the downside of it is I'm constantly changing it. The upside is I have some perspective into problems like yours because I could say without a shadow of a doubt, if you swapped your AVR or your TV, the problem might go away. But why are you gonna buy a brand new one of either of those if you don't need one? So the fact that you have a, a workaround is awesome. Let us know if you ever find something different or permanent and we'll go from there. But yeah, I'm just glad you got it working good enough for you. Now moving over to Patreon, Steve Wells has one of those VGA to S video adapters that you could use with the Mister, and wants to know if there's a way to hook it up through a VGA switch. So imagine that you have the D sub output of your Mr.'s I.O. board running into a VGA switch and output one goes to a SCART or a HD15 discard adapter. So you could plug it into that and output number two goes to this adapter. So S video or composite work and maybe even output three goes to a similar circuit that converts it to component video to work that way. I think that's a great idea, but the problem Steve has is those uh, those adapters require power. So I would definitely get one that has external power. I would also get one of the ones that is designed for the mic S cores if you're specifically using it with Mr. Unless like the one or two cores that don't support that yet are the ones that you're looking to play. But, uh, you know, I think this is one of those issues where I absolutely hate telling people that the thing that you bought, you might need to get rid of and, or, you know, throw it in a drawer and buy another one. But that might be by far the cheapest and easiest solution. And depending where you got that adapter from, uh, it might be better off to, to get a new one anyway. And that's not throwing shade. See, when uh, when these things first started happening, first we started doing RGB to S video conversion, which does work great, but you should definitely be powering that separately, not through any cables or anything like that. And then when Mike's circuits first came out, the first few were fine, but the latest edition is perfect basically. So this might be one of those things, Steve, where you just drop the couple of bucks on a new one. Uh, I'll leave a link to the one uh, to the Retro Castle store that sells them. I've been using that one. They're, they're absolutely great. They're Mike's circuit, so it's everything that you need. And I'm 99% sure that also has USB power built in. It has to, because I've always had to plug those in anyway. So while I normally would not want to say, you know, buy something different, it would be way cheaper than trying to figure out a way to inject power through a switch. And then what if you put a different cable in there? Or what if you forgot one day? It just everything about this screams change the adapter, not anything else in the setup. So I'll leave a link to the one that I've been using that should probably solve this issue. The only thing is if you actually want conversion, not just taking advantage of the YC and composite cores, I could understand that too, because what if you want simultaneous outputs, one RGB, one S video, I would just, I know I keep saying this, uh, I would either try to find a way to build power into the adapter that you already have, or wait for the other one. In fact, let me see if I could tease it for you here. Do I have it? Yeah, right here. For anybody watching on video, this is what's coming soon. This is a little teaser that I probably shouldn't even be showing, but it's absolutely awesome. And this also has 
the variable capacitor so you could dial in composite video for each, you know, for whatever system that you're using. So if you need a, a converter, that's the one I would buy. This should be available in about a month. Uh, and if you needed the Mike S core support through Mr., that's how I would do it. I would buy another one of those. So yeah, that's, that's how I would approach this one. Uh, but let me know if I'm missing something. Next up, Sir Chicken has an SNES style Rad 2X that they prefer to use over scalers when they test stuff so they don't need additional power. Would it be possible to wire an SNES style multi out to a SCART receptacle so that they could just plug other stuff into that and use it to test without having to add other power? And yes, it's 100% possible, but there are so many ifs. Um, is the voltage in the at the end of whatever SCART plug you're going to be connecting this going to be the proper voltage to power this? Because if it's expecting 5 volts, but you're getting 3.5, 12, whatever else, um, you know, don't forget the power over SCART cables is supposed to adhere to a standard, but in the context of retro gamers, it just kind of needs to be there. So when you use it to power stuff, it's not always a good idea. And it, often you could be under or overpowering it. So while it's possible, I just would not not at all. I would either pick up another Rad 2X or I would just use one of the scalers that you already own. But that was a great question. I'm certainly not uh, looking down at your question, but you know, I always got to be honest with my answers and I definitely wouldn't do that for a whole bunch of voltage and voltage related reasons. And it's a giant pain to wire that stuff up. You know, if you enjoy tinkering, cool, but you also have to remember, you know, what else could you be doing with the amount of time that it would make to hand wire or something like that? You know, would you be able to mod a console that you have in a closet and sell that on eBay for a heck of a lot more money than it would cost to just, you know, get another adapter for your, uh, you know, your existing scalers or something like that? I don't know. For me, time is the thing I have the least of. So stuff like that, I always put at the front of my mind when I answer questions like this. But you could do it. I just wouldn't. Next up, Gemini Man said they love connecting original wired controllers, and they've decided to add Bluetooth controllers to the collection, as in modern controllers, like not conversions, so like retro fighters, controllers, etc. Wired controllers were last decades, but do I think it's reasonable to add Bluetooth controllers to a long-term collection, considering they contain uh, internal batteries that will eventually swell or leak? Yes, I do, and here is all opinion. This is just an opinion, so if you all just disagree, that's completely okay. But controllers are the things that are constantly being held and pushed and smashed, and they're going to wear out. So being, uh, being able to purchase newer controllers that add features that you want, I think is important. And I think if you found some Bluetooth controllers that you like that have low latency, like the Retro Fighters one that I've tested and everything, then go for it. And if it, you know, quote unquote, only lasts 10 years, that's fine because now you're just putting less wear and tear on those wired controllers that might have sentimental value. They don't make them anymore. So it's stuff that, you know, with all respect to retro fighters, I, I like them. I, I've helped them and support them, but I don't think 20 years from now we're going to have nostalgia for, for that retro fighters controller. I think if they're still around, they're going to just be making newer and better controllers. Whereas 20 years from now, we're probably still going to have nostalgia for that stuff, including people who weren't even born then, or they're still going to want to try the original NES controller, you know, the original N64 silly ass controller. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I absolutely say go for it. And especially if they're made by a company who you know, actually cares about things like lag. So just my opinion, if you think I've missed a point or if you disagree, please let me know. And, you know, as always, I, I read all the comments and I try to take them all seriously, but responses that are just rude and pigheaded, I just I have a hard time taking seriously, even if you're right. So if you disagree and you think I completely missed the mark, definitely let me know, but try and make it a little polite, just a little. Next up, Dustin Madison has a pretty ridiculously funny question. Um, they want to preface this by saying they work 12-hour shifts at a factory, so uh, their brain's a little bit mush, and they just want to be silly and have some fun, so I'm all for it. But the question is, if me, Voltar, Mark and Corey from My Life and Gaming, Clint from Lazy Game Reviews, Tito from Macho Nacho, Jason, Metal Jesus Jason, and maybe John Riggs were locked in a large room, and the only way to get out was a Battle Royale-type brawling fist fight where only the last two standing would be set free. Who do you think is the toughest one of y'all and would likely win and be let out? I have no clue. In my experience in life, um, 
it, training matters first. If anybody there is a, you know, like a, a jujitsu black belt, then they're probably going to win. Or if they've been in the military, I've occasionally seen a few people that were just born with the ability to fight really well. But I could tell you who definitely, without a doubt, would go down first. Voltar. Next up, Tom M. wants to know if there's a way for supporters to get versions of the RSS podcasts without the ad injections. That's a great question and one that I really want to try to get a good answer for all of you. So when you say RSS podcasts, what I'm assuming that you mean is the through your normal apps that you would use, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever, uh, I'm assuming you mean can you just get that automatically on your devices without any of the ads? And I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no. I don't think any of those services have automatic um, integration with Patreon or Floatplane or anything like that. What I could do is I could start re-uploading everything as MP3s and just leave them on the server for people. I just, I don't think anybody used those. I think maybe one or two people did, and I would very happily do that. That's only going to be an extra couple of minutes of work every week, and I would do it for the weeklies, as well as for the any interviews and stuff like that. Because the weeklies, I put ads but between each section, and the ads match the videos on YouTube. It's actually, on a side note, I had somebody message me the other day very nicely, No, not anything negative, but they said that they were getting a ton of ads listening through one of the services that they use, just, you know, app through your phone type of thing. And so they switched over to watching the videos on YouTube, which have less ads. And that was really, really concerning because I take time every week to make sure that the ads drop exactly when that little character is walking across the screen right about in the middle so it doesn't interrupt any of the sections. And then I copy those time codes and put that in the audio only version which is a long way of saying it should be the exact same ads. So are you all getting a ton of ads for the audio only versions? Cause I certainly haven't heard that. And the, I don't really go back and listen to them again on audio only services. So I can't really confirm that. And I just use the major ones just cause it's easier. So that is really concerning. And also trying to get subscribers, this stuff ad free is also pretty concerning because I want to do that, but even the videos, it's kind of rough. And there's a few factors. And if you don't care about this behind the scenes crap, skip to the next question. But I do, for anybody who's wondering why I don't do these things, I do feel like I always owe you an explanation. Um, so audio only podcast, there's no integration with paid services. You could probably try, like if you only listen to my stuff on one service, you might be able to subscribe there, but I don't know if that would remove ads or not. So like don't subscribe on Patreon, but subscribe on Apple podcast or something. I don't know how that all would fall into place. I've never really tested it. No one's really asked about it. So the only thing I think I could offer in the short term is just MP3 uploads. Videos are far trickier. Floatplane's easy because um, that has the videos right on their service. But for YouTube, there's a couple of issues. First, I'm still a very small channel. So when I release a video, if Patreon subs uh, have already, or, you know, I guess Patreon's the biggest, but any monthly subs have all watched it through some private service with no ads, that's a pretty big chunk of what gets the algorithm rolling so that these videos could perform elsewhere. So the weeklies, I would be happy to do something like that, you know, a separate upload for audio and video just to make it easier for everybody. But the higher production videos really need to get kicked into the algorithm because that's like my marketing, I guess, is the best way to describe it. You know, those fancy videos that take 40, 50, 60 hours to make, those are what draw people in that go, oh, wow, this stuff's interesting to me. Let me subscribe. And, or, you know, hey, I love this stuff. Let me subscribe monthly or something like that. So that would be really hard. I guess if I ever hit 100,000 subs on YouTube, that's something I would definitely do is say, okay, I'm at a point now where the algorithm is going to be a little more helpful. Although these days it's probably more like 250,000, but whatever. Um, but I'm still just such a small channel that barely gets noticed that, believe it or not, having a thousand people not watch it right away or, you know, within a reasonable time would actually hurt the, uh, the, ret um, the retention rate and everything else. So, but that sucks because it means you're supporting me every month and you still have to sit through stupid ads. So I hate it. I, the thing that really drives me crazy is that if you're subscribed to me on YouTube, the monthly paid YouTube service, 
you still have to sit through ads, which is ridiculous. Why would you have to do that if you're paying for that content? It drives me nuts. And I, I contacted them a bunch of times and they definitely don't care at all. So um, yeah, I don't know. I would I would love to hear anybody's suggestions. If it, this is just about you know getting ad-free audio only stuff, I could very easily put MP3s up. Um, if you want videos that way, I could do it too. Uh, it just uh, for the weeklies at least, but I really would love your feedback. And if this is something that's bugging a lot of you, I'll figure it out. But if this is something where it's an annoyance for a handful of people, but it's not a make or break thing, I'll still keep looking. But, uh, but if this is something that's really important to everybody, I will just double down and figure out a solution for it in the short term. Uh, you know, uh, float plane is pretty cool because of the no ads, but at the same time, then you have to definitely use their app for it. And I haven't been putting audio versions of podcasts on float plane. Cause I don't think anybody wanted it there. Everybody just either watched the video on their phone or propped their phone up and listened, but also had the video if they wanted to glance over or something, but you know, please let me know what you all want. I just want to, I just want to show my appreciation to you all and provide whatever it is I possibly can when it makes sense, obviously. So thanks for the question, Tom. I, I got nothing now except MP3 uploads if you want, uh, but I would love to hear your further opinion and everybody else's as well. Next up, Adam Adam Ant has an extra SIO that they were considering installing in their friend's PlayStation who wants original discs and a way to play backups, but they're not sure what's up with it. Is it just as straightforward as check the compatibility list to see if your games, the, the games that you want to play work? And I would say yes. You already, If you already own one like you do and you want the ability to do discs and backups and the games are compatible, the, the games that you want to play are, it's a perfectly good solution. If the compatibility list shows that the games that are important to you are not playable, then I would definitely just go to any other solution whatsoever, including just a cheap mod chip and some CDRs. That's still a not terrible solution depending on how many backups or homebrew versus or patch games versus originals you want to play. And I guess that's basically it. I mean, there was a ton of drama around the SIO and all of it was deserved, but at the bottom, the bottom line with this is if the games that you want to play are listed as compatible, it's a perfectly good solution. Assuming you can get firmware for it, assuming all the other stuff that's out there. But Adam said they already own one, so I would absolutely just give it a shot and see what happens. Um, and hopefully that new one that's been teased will be out soon enough so we can have other cool ways to play backups and uh, also have the ability to retain original discs. Next up, Christopher Deo said they just got a Sony LMD 2451W. So it's a pro Sony 24 inch LCD monitor and they haven't really done anything other than power it on, but it does have some interesting features, on-screen video waveform and audio level meter. They don't have much of a use for this, they think, but they're interested to hear general thoughts on such a monitor. I think this is one of those awesome just test monitors. If this is something where you needed a spare monitor or a second monitor and you wanted these fun little options, why not go for it? But Steve from RetroTech tested that other LCD Sony PVM and it was terrible. Um, this one, if it's a widescreen one, it might be slightly newer. So I don't know, I would lag test it and I would do some very basic motion blur tests on it. Um, you know, plug it into your PC and go to the Blur Busters website and check it out versus the current monitor that you have. But I think that's more of a test case monitor. But sometimes those are great. The, the Dell monitor that you gave me is still sitting there and now it is officially my second monitor. I always have it there. It's gonna be in the, the video that's coming out on Saturday. You'll see it in every shot that there's a flat, almost every shot there's a flat panel. Um, and you know, as you said when you gave it to me, it's not really a great monitor, but it's got a ton of analog inputs. The lag is you know only about eight milliseconds, eight or I think under a frame, definitely. And it's 1080p, so it's just a perfect secondary beater monitor that has a great, I mean, it's perfect for me. So I think that either you're going to mess around with this LMD monitor and go, oh, this is perfect for XYZ, or you're going to go, well, that was neat. Who needs this thing? And give this one away too. So I think anybody that stumbles across weird and interesting monitors, even if they're terrible for gaming, take a step back and think, well, what else could I use this for? Because I certainly wouldn't recommend anybody game on any of these, but there's a million other uses for them. So I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts on it? Or, you know, maybe this is one for like uh, uh, Artemio or Keith Rainey or somebody. Are those on screen audio level meter or, or uh, video waveform meters going to be something that we could use? 
I don't know. That's a that's an interesting one, but congrats on another weird and neat monitor. Quantum Guitar has a really interesting question, and I'm going to preface this by saying your average person, including your average retro nerd, should just try not to think about it. That's my answer to most people. But nerds like us um, sometimes at least want to know the answer to the question, even if it's not something they would go through. And the question is, with analog video consoles, be it age or just the nature of analog video, always having a large variance between them, what's the best way to normalize that? Is it doing something like taking original consoles and running them through a RetroTINK 5X or 4K with the auto calibration and then having it output 240p and then just using a DAC, a good quality DAC, to go to your RGB monitor. Is that a solution for perfectionists? And yes, uh, but even the even in zero latency modes, it still buffers a few lines of video, which is absolutely imperceptible by a human, but light guns won't work or the Master System 3D glasses or something. So doing stuff like that, um, it would absolutely work as long as you're not using any peripherals. But it might not make that big of a difference on CRTs depending on the quality. And if you're somebody who just spent five grand on a calibrated D24 or something like that, or 15 grand on a calibrated D32, if you could ever find one of those, you might actually be better off modding each individual console or using a mister, which will always have the consistent output, or most of the time at least. So, and that's ridiculous, but like I said, this is the nerd answer for our, my fellow nerds. You might actually want to open each console, and if a bypass is available, like the triple bypass or uh, the any like the one chip or two chip SNES bypasses, do it. And if it still doesn't match up, try changing the components on the bypass board. So, like if if you do this to three consoles, and two of the three are at 700 millivolts, and then one of them's at 680 or 710, change the resistors to uh, to slightly different values until you're able to normalize that one. But that's some pretty OCD level stuff. And I don't know if you would ever truly notice a difference on even a calibrated CRT unless it was way off. I have absolutely seen a bunch of consoles that were 630, 615. And that, that's too low in most cases for, for perfectionists. But you know, are you going to notice a difference? And I would say on a consumer CRT, probably not. On a calibrated BVM, yeah, but how much does it actually matter? And one of the things that I've really started to move over to is using Mister for it with a good DAC, like the built-in one with the Retro Castle case or one of the ones that Kuro talked about. When quality is the utmost importance to me, I go through a Mister and use it that way. But I also, in, in doing that, I've really had a newly renewed appreciation for just using analog consoles and CRTs as they are, with some some exceptions, right? I don't want to put a two-chip SNES into a, a BVM without that bypass on there, but for the most part, uh, or like a really noisy Genesis 1 without a video fix to it, but other than that, I, you know, I guess Genesis 1 is a good example because you're never going to get flawless video out of it. You could get it really good. And I just appreciate it for what it is. I just think this is neat. This is part of the experience. So by no means, Quantum Guitar, am I trying to tell you how to approach your setup. I just wanted to offer my own perspective for anybody else listening. But yeah, you could really go crazy trying to get every console perfect. I personally, if it's something that's been bothering you, I would measure all of them and just find a happy medium. So let's say you have eight consoles that you use all the time, and you know five of them are at 680 millivolts, but one of them's at 600, another one's at 610, and you know the other one's at 740 or something. Just work on those to bring everything kind of in the middle so that you can calibrate around that. But once again, I'm gonna end with how I started. This is over obsession. This is fine if you understand that you're being obsessive, which just, I have no problem with that, but I do not recommend going above and beyond for your average person for stuff like this, even for your average nerd. But I do always love talking about it because it adds perspective to stuff. And even if you don't end up doing it, it helps, I think at least, it helps you visualize the differences between these things and how major or minor they might be depending on the setup. 
Next up, Justin Sizon ran over their 3DS charger with their office chair wheel. Oh, I hate when stuff like that happens. Specifically, the actual connector that goes into the 3DS. It still fits in the 3DS, but it's a tighter fit as it's visibly mangled. What I see, the charger is still worth hanging on to. They did order another one just to be safe. So I would take a very close visual inspection. I would use a magnifying glass or take a picture with your phone and zoom in or something like that. And I would try to see what's damaged. If the metal was just squished a little bit, you should be able to take some pliers and just bend it back out. And that should be okay. But if it's, um, if it's all messed up or if the pins look like they're bad, what you could do is open up, uh, and I've never done this before, so I don't know if it's possible on the 3DS charger. I don't know if you could actually open up the AC side of it or you'd have to break the plastic. But if you could open them up, that might be a good time for a really cheap garbage power supply that I would never, ever recommend because you just pop it open, replace or take the cable out, put the cable into the official Nintendo charger and use that. Um, you know, and depending on how cheap the charger is, that might be cheaper than trying to do it anything else. But I would start with just the physical condition. Is it just gonna need a little bit of bending or did it really kind of get all messed up? Um, also, any thoughts on those generic multi-USB charging cables for all those consoles? Uh, no, I would never use them. First and foremost, I would never use a power supply that doesn't have some kind of official safety rating on it. You know, ULC, whatever. I would also be very wary of power supplies that have uh, ratings from certain ratings companies that have reputations of maybe it's easy to get through their, their services or not. You know, one of those, like, I don't want to see the names because these are just rumors that I have no proof of, but there's definitely a few names of companies where it's like, you see that name and you're like, that's not one of the major companies. I've heard stories. So yeah, I, I would just be very careful when it comes to power because, you know, paying a little more for a good power supply if you didn't need to, what did you really waste? And if you did need to versus one of those junky adapters, you may have just saved your console. So yeah, it's just as a general rule, if it has no safety ratings on it, throw it in the garbage. It's just a potential fire hazard. Um, and other than that, you kind of have to use your own discretion. I would also at least look up the safety ratings too, because that way you could tell if somebody just cloned a sticker from somebody else. But yeah, power's tricky. That that um, podcast we did on it was pretty important. And a lot of people still blew that off. But to the ones who didn't, you're smart. You're going to have your your all of your equipment last a lot longer. Next up, Josh Lopez wants to know if I have any tips on getting the stiffness out of retro controller cables. Yes, I've had a method that I've used for years now that worked fine and it seems safe. Take the tallest shelf you have in your house or on top of a refrigerator or whatever else and take the part that plugs into the console and kind of clip it up there or do it in a way where you're not going to hurt the cable. For me, I would kind of put it through the door of a cabinet and uh, close the door, but there's always a gap anyway. So it would basically catch the plug part on that lip. So it wouldn't crimp the cable. It wouldn't, you're not even really turning it sideways and I would let it dangle. So the controller itself is weighing down the cable and that way you're not putting too much pressure on it, but you're putting more than just the, uh, the plug end of it. And I would just leave it that way for you know a long time I, in fact i have my setup which i've showed a whole bunch of times you could check out the room tour if you're interested but um, when all of my cables were stretched properly then i did the opposite and i put all of them in a box cut a hole in the side of the box and draped the cables out the side so now they're all stretched out and they stay that way it also keeps dust out of the controllers you get you get dust on the cables but that's less of an issue you just wipe it down if you really want to but that way you don't have that weird grimy feeling on the controllers so start with the opposite hang it from the plug end somewhere in a way that's safe and then just wait as long as it takes for it to kind of even out it should take at least a couple of weeks and then once they're good enough then do the opposite i would just take any of those like i have a banker's box style thing with a hole cut in the side and that way you could still put the top on with all the cables draped out i if you have the ability to do that i would and if you have any sense of uh, design interior design or creativity i guarantee you could make it look way better than me <laughs> or I get an old beat up Ikea shelf and buy a door for it and cut a hole so it goes into the shell you know there's so many better looking ways to do what I do but I, the basic premise is the same and hopefully you could stretch your controllers that way 
The dressing gown wants to know what's the cheapest solution for getting composite video converted to input into an OSSC, specifically for the NES and N64. So that's a hard one to answer because any suggestion that I have is going to cost a, a chunk of money and that might be better spent to a more final solution. So I'll start out by saying you're probably going to end up getting a RetroTINK 5X instead. But if you wanted to hold on to the OSSC, let's say if the situation is the dressing gown has a ton of arcade boards and retro PCs that aren't fully compatible with the Tink 5X, but are with the OSSC, and they're eventually going to pick up a retro Tink 4K that could do all of this, but want a solution for right now. If that were the case, you could take the Core U transcoder and go from composite and S video to uh, component video. That would absolutely work. Uh, you could try to pick up any of the RetroTINK 2Xs and set them to pass through mode and then use just a cheap DAC like uh, the Benfi one is a great one for that. And then just don't run the audio into the Tink, run it directly into the OSSC and then take the HDMI to VGA converter and put it to the VGA input of the OSSC. That would work. Um, but I mean, you kind of, you're going to have to figure a total, total cost solution for that. And what else would you use it for? So in the case of the core, you, you might use that for a whole bunch of other things. And in fact, what if you even have a BVM that doesn't have a composite or S video input card, but you do have an RGB component video input, then that would be cheaper than buying an RGB or a, comp a composite video card for your BVM. So now that core, you transcoder has multiple different uses. So I would think of the total solution and go from there. My short answer to you is either use a Tink 2X that you may have laying around or somebody might want to sell you or pick up a CoreU transcoder. I'll leave a link to the CoreU if uh, you want more info on that. Next, Lily Larceny just got a retro Tink 4K and is having some issues with it. First, before I go any further, I would absolutely recommend getting the latest firmware on it just because Mike is always tweaking stuff. You probably already did, Lily, but just for anybody else asking, that's always my first suggestion is make sure you're on the latest firmware. And Mike doesn't lock firmwares or anything. If for whatever reason, this firmware breaks something that worked last time, you can just put the other firmware on. It only takes a second, so not a big deal there. Start with that one and go from there. Um, the, I'll answer your second question first because it's easier. Lily's having trouble with a car, um, the GC video-based Carby for the GameCube and Rogue Squadron 2, which shifts resolution mid-game for short cutscenes. Their Samsung TV can't handle it, or maybe their HDMI switch can't, and the Tink has to be in triple buffer mode for it to work. Their TCL TV doesn't have any problem with it at all. They heard this problem didn't exist on GC Video Firmware 2.4. Is it worth it to downgrade the firmware? So first of all, that's definitely something I've just run into with, uh, with different HDMI switches and TVs, and it could just be unfixable. So the fact that it works on your TCL and not on the others, I personally would just try to go direct into the Samsung just to see if it's the test smart switch, because if it is, that's a pretty easy swap out. Um, but it could just be that your Samsung TV is going to require triple buffer mode for that, or else it's just going to kind of get weird. Um, now, as far as downgrading GC video firmware, I definitely wouldn't downgrade. It might be worth borrowing somebody else's Carby that's one of the older ones that's still on 2.4, or I guess any GC video solution, just to see if that fixes it. But the newer firmware also gets you easier ways to update the firmware and some more features. So I wouldn't go back to 2.4 unless it's really the only solution. But please let us know what you find, because that's kind of an interesting one. I, I'd be really surprised if downgrading would be the only way around that, but it's possible. And lastly, uh, they've had issues getting their Pixel FX Black Dog HDMI modded consoles working properly with the Tink 4K. They tried to, uh, to get it to sync. They tried to go in for direct mode, and it just wasn't really able to work right. So I know it has worked because I've seen pictures of it. I don't own any of those consoles, so I can't test myself. But I think what it, what's really necessary is the RetroTINK 4K needs to have the latest firmware so it detects all this stuff. And those consoles need firmware updates as well that properly send, uh, for a lack of a better term, direct video so that the scaler could do all of it. This is absolutely in PixelFX's best interest to get this right, 
because their own scaler, if it's released, will have the exact same problems. So that's something that I hope that they're working on. But the what I would recommend at this point is check out the RetroTink Discord server. I guess the Pixel FX Discord server, I'm not sure if they'd be willing to help you out with the RetroTink problem, but I would ask in either one of those and see if anybody's got it working because maybe they could just share a profile. And that's one of the things that I love about the Tink 4K. Previously with the OSSC or the Tink 5X, when you shared profiles, you'd have to one way or another dial it in yourself, reflash, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas now you drop a file on an SD card and you're done. So I would definitely check that out first. Uh, also check out Wobbling Pixels repository. Um, I think they're mostly concentrated on analog cables, but who knows? Maybe they already have custom profiles made for this stuff. But yeah, I guess the the short answer once again, try the latest firmwares for everything, then go to the discords and try to figure out if anybody has profiles pre-made. And you know, let me know about the GC video thing because that's weird. I would uh, I hadn't heard that one before, so maybe it is just a combination of TV and switch, but the 2.4 versus 3.1, I'd really want to know the answer to that. And I I think if it's something that's fixable, Ingo would probably be willing to whip up another firmware for that. So we'll see. But yeah, let us know. Well, that's it for this week. If you're new to these Q&As, feel free to ask any question you would like wherever it is that you support in the latest Q&A post. The way the services work, I can't really figure out what's a new question on an old post. Plus, as you saw today, I love just scrolling through in real time and answering questions as if we were hanging out together somewhere. So any questions you have, let me know. And if I miss it, it's never on purpose. It's always because it got deleted in post by accident, or maybe the question came in after I was done recording, but before the new one was posted. So if you have any issues, always feel free to DM me. But as always, thank you to everybody who does participate in these, people who just support in any way. You're all awesome. Thank you so much, and I will see you next week.